Hello, BookTube. It's time for about well, day 11 of our Maze for Magazine events, and we're continuing to read an article from Chambers Journal of Popular Literature, Science, and Arts from Saturday, April 17th, 1886, and the article is entitled The Old Priory Garden. The whispering May wind stirs the hawthorn and lilac in the old priory garden and brings great gushes of delicious scent past the window and fills the room with sweetness. All the last month the weather has been fitful and changeable. Rain and storms, sunshine and cloud, dust and east winds. But after two days of soaking downpour and wild west wind, the morning of the last day of May has dawned in the full glorious beauty of late spring. Thrushes and blackbirds vie with each other in song sweet and shrill, clear and inspiring. A modest siskin whistles its little monotonous rollade. Now and then a few notes of the shy linnet are heard. A robin is feeding its brood close by. Swallows and martins are darting about in all directions. In the apple blossoms are hundreds of bees making a dense, dreamy music, while the compatriot, the bumblebee, booms along with its big velvety body shining and gleaming in the sun. What a splendid creature! See it settles close at hand, turn it over with the grass bent, with a surprise buzz it rights itself. Again and yet again it turns over, seemingly staring to see the cause of its overthrow. Draw the bent lightly across his back. Two legs are instantly raised to brush off the unwelcome touch. A second time, the same. A third, and the bent is fairly clutched by all the gummy legs and retained under its body. It crawls up a stick and, with angry bustle, goes booming off. One does not realize summer is so close upon us when May is such a capricious maiden till a morning like this wakes one up to the conviction that in 24 more days the sun will have reached its altitude and soon will begin the shortening days again. The garden here is quaint and quite unlike the generality of town gardens. From the square paved court rises one step and then a stretch of grass, an oval flower bed each side, a path up the center, Sloping grass banks, supported with large stones, where huge bunches of primroses spring from the niches. Along the sides are rockeries and hardy trailing plants, stone crop. Prairiewinkle, both major and minor, white and blue, with variegated foliage. Sweet woodruff, violets, and a mass of ferns, whose delicate light silver-green fawns fronds are daily uncurling into beauty. The wildflowers are in full bloom. Later on, the germander speedwell will open its bright, evanescent flowers. That, though only a wild plant, makes such a splendid masses of color when cultivated with the silver foliage in bunches near it. Up a short flight of stone steps, with ferns on each side, under an ivory-covered archway, and on another plant of grass, with a long flower bed, with trellis work at the back, covered with the red and yellow honeysuckle, and a large mass of climbing roses, the rare delicate maiden blush, which in a fortnight will be heavy with blooms. More rockeries and ferns, lilies of the valley and forget-me-nots under the uh, syringa bushes and sweet briar. In another corner are tall irises and great white lilies, and here and there a bunch of orange tiger lilies. And here and there a bunch of orange tiger lilies. Uh, southern wood, lavender and rosemary, variegated balm in profusion. Soon the fragrant pinks and their aristocratic relations, the carnations, will be in bloom, and the rich velvety pansies that are now so large and perfect will dwindle as the sun shines more 
gains more power and the strawberries begin to crimson on the sunny south beds and the geraniums and verbenas and purple heliotropes take the place of Ocaras and the Narcissus. Round the square of vegetable garden is a, a wide path which beds sloping with beds sloping to the walls, one of which of good brick and plum cherry and other flute trees trained along it. The other is a real old stone wall belonging to the Antient Priory and formerly stood close by. At one time this wall was covered with a dense moss of ivy, ivy and in which colonies of sparrows built their nests, reared their young, and flourished nightly. Snails, slugs, and wood lice swarmed, and beetles in endless variety. One wild day in a wet November, part of the wall, old wall came down, breaking up the trees and cutting up the borders and turf. It was patched up again, and just as the spinach uh, was fit to cut and lettuce planted out, there was a soaking rain one night, and uh, in the morning the old wall was again prostrate over our spring plantings. Such a wreck it was, and disturbed the equilibrium for days. It was soon set straight as regards the stonework, but it was weeks before the place looked itself again, and that crumbling old wall was watched with suspicion all summer. Then, outdoor life coming to an end, we ceased to think on the subject. October following was mild and balmy for the first few days. Then the wind shifted suddenly to the east and four or five nights of sharp frost came first turned all the that turned all the foliage into a golden glory a steady downpour of a week culminating with a tremendous windstorm it blew and whistled and st stormed till every leaf was swept away into space going no one knew whether howling uh, and whistling around the chimney stacks till night was made terrible. During the worst of the storm, in the early morning, down came the old wall again from end to end, cutting up turf, breaking down the fruit trees, and overwhelming the shrubs and rockeries in the general wreck. For many weeks did the state of chaos continue. Wretched, drenched fowl made themselves at home in the flower beds, and forlorn looking ducks wandered across, feasted on the host of slugs and fat snails and beetles that the pouring rain had tempted out of the nooks and crevices of the stones and mass of ivory. It was built up at last, but uh, little or nothing could be done to repair the ravages done to the garden till the end of March, except making a general clearance of the rubbish and one of the quaintest of shady corners seemed lost forever, but after a few fine balmy days and a spell of sunshine, curious things happened under the rebuilt wall. Stray snowdrops snow appeared in places where none had been hitherto. A bunch of pure white crocuses unfolded their blossoms to the sun in one place, two or three stray stars of Bethlehem in another. Later on, a single stem shot up of yellow lent lilies, bunches of termentilla with double yellow blossoms and clover with deep brown, red-brown leaves and big snowy balls of flower. The mouse here, hawkweed and trailing moneywort. Uh, down amongst the remains of the common turf came a thick growth of parsley peart with its chase close fine edged leaves and uh, cuckoo pint, pint and delicate pink white flowers on the wall between the new mortar and the old stones came little fibers of crimson tipped boss stone crop sandwort pellitory of the wall and in one place a single plant of flax with the pale blue flowers and long spear-like leaves 
without mentioning the more common chickweed, ground cell, wild favor flu, and the plantain yellow wildflowers and many different sorts of grasses and mosses. There is no doubt most of these plants had had uh, come from the seeds brought to the nest by uh, in the ivy by the birds and had lain there in the dry rubble for years, some perhaps for generations, simply because there was no moisture enough to cause the seeds to sprout and germinate. If a grain of wheat fall to the ground and live, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit, which seems inguimenical until pondered over and thought out. How then, how often have the great cowled monks strolled around this old garden marking how this tree promised a bounteous crop of cherries, luscious uh, morales, and when cunningly steeped in spirits with due portion of mace cloves, cinnamon, and sugar makes a liqueur fit for a drink of princess. Or, noting how the garnelled old apple trees, then young and in full bearing, were covered with garlands of pink and white blossoms that promised later in the autumn a rich harvest of golden fruit, ladies' fingers, ripstone pippins, codlings, golden russets, blenheim orange, and uh, sourlings for winter keeping. Also the frail bl uh, blooms of the pear trees, jargonelle, Mary Louise, baking pears, enormous size with the rich, juicy bishop's thumbs and brown burleys. Now a young lay brother will come to pick dainty bits of herbs for flavoring of soups and stews and their accompaniment of essential vegetables for in those old palmy days seldom did their genial faces have anchorite written on them. Go to the extreme end of the garden and turn round with a delightful view meets the gaze. Down in the hollow lies a sleepy little town with its quaint gabled houses and nearly embedded in a wealth of lime trees. Far away, when the wind is high and the atmosphere clear, are seen ranges of fertile hills for miles, or the distance is wrapped uh, in a soft purple haze that is still more lovely. And over all this, the deep blue sky with fiercely white clouds and the blessed sunshine pouring down over all the wealth of buds and blossoms, singing birds and busy humming bees. I came across the other day an account of what a naturalist found in a square of backyard nearly uncultivated. Why such a place would, as this old priory garden would give him pleasure and profit for months, nay years, for not a tenth part of all the natural loveliness has been exhausted yet. Some other time, perhaps, I shall tell something more of what I find here as the years glide onward. So that was a bit of a longer one. And uh, I floundered in a few places there. There's some of the names of plants that I'm not too familiar with. But I really enjoyed that one. Um, again, there's no author for this. I'm going to take a look now online to see if I can maybe find an author. If I do, I'll add it uh, to the notes below. But anywhere, anyway, um, we'll see you for day 14. Take care, book two.